All right, everybody. Welcome back. Um, today we are going to be talking about Chapter 14, which is an introduction to metabolism. Um, in this chapter, we'll be covering just sections 1, 2, and 3. And this video is actually going to pertain to our next two class meetings. Um, so this is just one video lecture that you have to watch um, for two course class meetings. So, um, again, as always, here are your learning objectives for this chapter. And now let's get started. So, basically, what is metabolism? Well, the textbook discovers, um, defines metabolism as the overall process through which living systems acquire and use free energy to carry out their various functions. So, this can be broken up into two categories. Oh, we lost a category. So it's either catabolism or anabolism. Okay. So in catabolism, we have the degradation or the breakdown of nutrients and cell constituents in order to salvage their components and or to generate energy. So here we can see um, we can break down carbohydrates, fats, or proteins through catabolism. Um, which is oxidative and exergonic in order to produce ATP and NADPH um, as well as our end products of water, CO2, and ammonia. Now on the flip side, anabolism is where biomolecules are synthesized from simpler compounds. So we'll get amino acids, sugars, fatty acids, and nitrogenous, nitrogenous bases, which may be side products of catabolism, in order to build them together using energy from ATP and NADPH to build our cellular macromolecules, such as proteins, polysaccharides, lipids, and nucleic acids. <clears throat> So there's a variety of different metabolic systems um, based on how the energy is derived. So photoautotrophic cells will derive energy from the sun in order to produce their energy storage molecules, while heterotrophic cells break down um, organic matter in order to develop the energy they need to produce um, their macromolecules or cellular constituents. Uh, in almost all cases, all heterotrophs and, and uh, photo, photoautotrophs utilize vitamins or minerals, which are um, molecules that the organism cannot generate on their own, cannot synthesize, so these are taken in through diet. Um, minerals you can see here are some trace minerals that must be taken up in order for metabolism to occur, um, such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, iron, copper. We know why we need iron, right? Iron is essential for hemoglobin um, and oxygen transport. Magnesium is important in um, nucleic acid um, polymerization. Okay, and also vitamins. Um, you can have either water-soluble vitamins or fat-soluble vitamins that are necessary for metabolism to occur. Um, a lot of them here, this table lists out the coenzyme product. So a lot of these vitamins are necessary coenzymes for metabolic processes to occur. We can see that the reaction that these vitamins um, partake in, and then if we are deficient, in a certain vitamin, we can see the diseases that it causes. Um, you, it is not really necessary for you to memorize this table, but it's just here for your reference and your curiosity. Um, as we continue in the course, maybe you can come back and reflect on these vitamins um, as we're going through things like glycolysis or the citric acid cycle where we see things like coenzyme A come into play um, or um, B6. B12, B2, and so on and so forth. So metabolic pathways are a series of enzyme-governed reactions. And if we look, what we're looking at basically is the same three pictures. So we got picture one, picture two, picture three. In picture one, basically we're just looking at um, catabolism, 
right? So we have the breakdown of macromolecules such as proteins, polysaccharides, or lipids um, broken down into their polymer such as amino acids, glucose, or um, glycerol, or fatty acids, and then how these are broken down into the common metabolites of um, acetyl-CoA or pyruvate, and then how acetyl-pyruvate um, is converted to acetyl-CoA and then shuttled through the citric acid cycle in order to generate ATP, and other metabolite byproducts. So as you can see, we can start through either macromolecule and we'll end up with the basic same products via the common metabolite of pyruvate or acetyl-CoA, but it's these steps here that in between that may determine whether or not we would prefer to generate ATP from glucose, which is sort of our fast, easy access. It costs little in the beginning in order to generate a lot of ATP. However, we remember from our lipids chapter that one molecule of um, glycerol can actually generate a lot more um, ATP than um, one glucose from glycogen. However, the, the initial, think of as the energy of activation to get from here to here requires more input than in lipids than it does for glucose. And this is something we'll talk about in more detail when we start talking about the specific metabolic pathways. Um, next week we'll start talking about um, glycolysis and we'll see that in a little more detail later on. Um, picture two is this same catabolic pathway except now we see where um, ADP is generated is used to generate ATP or NADH and then also we can see where ATP is generated here in oxidative phosphorylation we can see the roles that NADH play um, in glycolysis as well as the roles of our um, NAD and FAD which we'll talk about those later in oxidative phosphorylation image three is basically the same thing. We can see the citric acid cycle and glycolysis here. However, we've added anabolism as well. So you can see how all of these different metabolic pathways become interconnected through common metabolites and then also can diverge into different pathways depending on whether you are building biomolecules or breaking biomolecules down. And so it becomes this wonderfully complex, beautiful web of intracellular interactions that are going on. So enzymes catalyze reactions of metabolic pathways. <clears throat> and it's usually these enzymes that we can control in order to control whether or not the metabolic pathway moves forward. So the various reactions that enzymes catalyze are breaking down into four basic categories. We can have oxidation reduction reactions, which we'll talk in more detail in just a minute. And in oxidation reduction reactions, you have electrons are transferred between molecules. So this is where um, NAD and FAD play a role as, as electron acceptors and donators. Now we also have group transfer reactions, so these are governed by transferases or hydrolases where functional groups are transferred from one molecule to another. We also have eliminations, isomerations, or rearrangements. Um, this is where we remove or move functional groups around on a molecule. And then we also have reactions that can make or break carbon-carbon bonds. So you have hydrolases, lyases, or ligases, again removing or adding functional groups. Um, without transferring from another molecule. So most metabolic reactions are thermodynamically controlled and that maybe 90% of the steps in a reaction, um, delta G is near zero and close to equilibrium. Therefore, the steps in, in these reactions can be easily halted or reversed by just changing the ratios of the products to reactants. So if we increase products, we will stop the equilibrium or the reaction from going in the forward direction. Or if we increase the substrates um, or the reactants, then we will push the reaction further faster. 
However, some steps function far from equilibrium and are therefore irreversible. So reactants accumulate in large excess, therefore making delta G very, very negative. Now these steps are what generate metabolic flux. Again, they are irreversible and are usually the sites of enzymatic control. Now our implications of thermodynamic control that we just talked about are that all metabolic pathways are irreversible. So once we reach some of these flux creating um, steps in the metabolic process, we can no longer go backward. Again, um, this is growing on what I just said, every pathway has a first committed step that is early in the pathway. So let's say we have step one, two, three, four, okay? Now really, hold on, let me, I wanna erase this guy, okay? So step, between step one and two, our delta G may be close to zero. So we're in equilibrium, we're kind of going forward. But from two to three, we may have a very large negative delta G so that we cannot go back from three to two. So working in the reverse direction is not gonna happen because the accumulation of this substrate is so high and delta G is so negative that you're not gonna go in the reverse direction. So this would be considered one of our first committed steps in the metabolic pathway. And usually there is one that's very early in the pathway. So now we're committed, and so now we are building up three, which is pushing us into four, which will then push us into the next step as well, since these are near equilibrium. And then catabolic and anabolic pathways differ. So often the enzymes that govern the conversion of one to two is going to be different from the enzyme that um, has the conversion of two to one. And we can control whether or not these enzymes are present. This goes on into our next thing. So controlling metabolic flux through enzyme control. So we can control enzymes, as we remember when we were discussing um, in class on Monday, we can control enzymes through allosteric control, right? So does something bind to the enzyme that increases the enzyme activity or something that can bind to the enzyme that decreases enzyme activity, such as an example of feedback inhibition. Mm -hmm. So in feedback inhibition, a product or a byproduct of a metabolic step further down the metabolic process will come and bind to an enzyme earlier in the process to inhibit further formation of that enzyme's product. So that could be an example of allosteric control where this becomes either a um, competitive inhibitor or a non-competitive inhibitor that prohibits further formation of more products. We can also covalently modify enzymes in order to activate them or deactivate them. So a lot of enzymes that we see in glycolysis become activated upon dephosphorylation or phosphorylation. So adding a phosphate group, um, dephosphorylation, will then activate the protein or the enzyme or deactivate it. We can also control it through substrate cycles, sort of similar to feedback inhibition, um, except that when we're in steps that are near equilibrium or near delta G, if both enzymes are present, um, let's say we have A goes to B, Okay, so if the enzyme that converts A to B is present as well as the enzyme that converts B to A is present and both of these are near equilibrium, then we'll just be continually going back and forth between the two until an enzyme that converts B to C becomes available and now all of a sudden all the B is going to C which then produces more, which then causes A to be converted to B. So we're shifting our equilibrium 
more in this direction um, whenever we make this enzyme present. So we'll call this enzyme B and enzyme A. Okay? Uh, again, so part of that, the substrate cycle that I was just talking about, part of that is genetic control. So whether or not the cell is actively expressing for that enzyme. So, you know, going from DNA to RNA to protein. And so often in DNA... Um, in order for DNA to get um, translated into messenger RNA and then transcribed into protein, often the triggering of DNA into messenger RNA is triggered through promoter regions that are upstream for the gene for the protein that you're trying to express. And oftentimes, um, expression of a gene is turned on when molecules bind to that promoter region and the binding to that promoter region then causes the gene to get expressed and the enzyme to become um, expressed in the cell. And so oftentimes these um, promoter binding molecules may be byproducts um, earlier in the stream of a metabolic pathway or some sort of dietary trigger um, or some sort of environmental influence as well. So when we're talking about metabolism, we need to talk about high energy compounds. So when we're talking about hydrogenium compounds, we're sort of talking about how the cell temporarily stores this free energy um, during um, catabolism in order to use that energy later on in anabolism quickly. So energy is released upon the complete oxidation of molecules such as glucose are stored in high energy intermediates such as ATP. These molecules are then broken down to drive inorganic processes in the future. So here is a table of various high energy molecules. And here we can see their delta G upon um, hydrolysis or breakdown. So you have phosphophenopyruvate, which is PPE, 1,3-bisphosphate glycerate, you know, these are all at the top. Then we have ATP. When ATP is hydrolyzed to AMP plus um, PPI, inorganic pyrophosphate, we first get a release of negative 45.6 kilojoules per mole. Furthermore, inorganic pyrophosphate will further um, degrade into two phosphates for an additional 19.2 kilojoules of mole of energy release. So really, we can kind of talk about these as a summation in that it's approximately negative 60 kilojoules per mole because this will happen rather spontaneously. Furthermore, we can get acetophosphate, phosphocreatine. You can read about these in your textbook. We can also just hydrolyze one phosphate group from ATP in order to make ADP, and here we'll just release negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole. And we'll talk about instances in glycolysis in the citric acid cycle where we would prefer to do the complete hydrolysis or just one phosphate group. Then below that, we get to glucose, one phosphate, um, phosphopyruvate, fructose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, and glycerol 6-phosphate. So you can see these are sort of lower energy um, release. So, and like I said, the cell's main currency for energy is ATP. And you'll read about ATP is quickly consumed. Um, I think it said it, at rest, humans burn through 1.5 kilograms of ATP per minute. I believe was, I don't want to steer us wrong on that. I think it's per minute. So if you think about it, we are consuming and developing ATP very rapidly, even at a resting state, which to me is, is pretty impressive. And I think if we calculated it, we could figure out how much ATP by weight does a human go through a day. And it's, it's remarkable how much we 
burn and make in a day. So let me see. Oh, per hour. So it's 1.5 kilograms of ATP per hour. And still quite a lot. All right. So now, why ATP? Why did the cell evolve to utilize ATP as its energy currency? Well, there's three reasons. First, not they, but the hydrolysis products of ATP are more resonantly stabilized. So we're asking why does the hydrolysis of the phosphoanhydride bonds, so these bonds here and here, why is it breaking these phosphoanhydride bonds release so much energy? So remember if we break the bond here and here, we are going to generate a total of 60 kilojoules per mole. And then if we break just one of the bonds to form ADP, we're going to get negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole. So one of the reasons is because the hydrolysis products, this guy or this guy, is much more res resonantly stabilized than ATP itself. And so you remember from organic chemistry, when we talked about the more the molecule can resonate, the more these double bonds can move around, the more stable the molecule is. So these guys, either inorganic phosphate or even um, phosphate um, pyruvate, are more stable than ATP as a whole unit. Also, at physiological pH, ATP is going to carry anywhere from negative 3 to negative 4 charges. The hydrolysis products, therefore, can relieve that electrostatic tension on the molecule. Also, the products of ATP hydrolysis are more favorably sol solvated than for ATP. So to solvate these guys independently is actually more favorable than solvating the whole ATP molecule as a whole. Plus, you also have a positive entropy of forming three molecules from one. Now we can use this energy derived from the hydrolysis of the phosphoanhydride bonds to couple with reactions in order to drive inorganic processes. So often in metabolism, an endergonic reaction will be coupled with a highly exergonic reaction, such as the hydrolysis of um, the phosphoanhydride bonds and ATP, in order to move the reaction forward. So often this is discussed in half reactions. Um, an example that the book gives us is the phosphorylation of glucose 6-phosphate. So if we take inorganic phosphate, add it to glucose in a dehydration reaction, it's going to cost us 13.8 kilojoules per mole. Now if we couple that with the um, hydrolysis of an ATP in order to form ADP and the inorganic phosphate, we will get a release of negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole. So overall, coupling these two reactions together, so we have ATP plus glucose yields ADP plus glucose 6-phosphate. So we transferred one of the phosphate groups to glucose. Coupling that release of energy with the absorption of energy, we get an overall negative delta G of negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole so that the reaction will go more in the favorable product favored um, formation. So uh, uh, often it's the phosphoanhydride hydrolysis that drives um, the majority of the metabol metabolic processes that we will see. Um, and so these are often what are coupled in order to generate um, metabolic flux. And so Let's read this real quick. So the biological processes that are endergonic are often driven forward by coupling to phosphoryl transfer from an ATP to a molecule, such as in glucose 6-phosphate, or just the hydrolysis of the phosphoanhydride bond without transfer. So both processes require enzymes because even though the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP 
plus PI, even though that is um, delta G favored, it's an overall negative delta G, so thermodynamically it's favored, the activation energy for this process is so high that kinetically this reaction is very slow. Therefore, enzymes such as hexokinases can decrease that activation of energy for ATP hydrolysis and then based on what type of enzyme you're using, you can direct the phosphate group transfer or simply just the phosphate group hydrolysis. So let's say we're just doing the hydrolysis in order to spur the reaction forward or we're doing hydrolysis in order to transfer the phosphate group to activate a molecule. So here is another example of where we're using ATP hydrolysis not as a transferring uh, or phosphorylating mechanism, but as just to couple the energy. So we have amino acid plus ATP. We hydrolyze um, to AMP plus um, pyrophosphate. And then pyrophosphate is further hydrolyzed to generate more energy. So now we have an overall um, negative delta G of negative 60 kilojoules per mole. Temporarily, the AMP is bound to that amino acid, but then transfer RNA can then come in, displace the AMP, and now we have our amino acylated tRNA that is ready um, to grow our peptide chain. So this is in um, protein synthesis that this reaction occurs. So there are other compounds that have high phosphoryl group transfer than just ATP, um, and we will talk about them in more detail later. Um, this picture is a little higher, but PPP or phosphopyrenol pyruvate is here. So you have PPP, 1,3-PPG, phosphocarotene, ATP, glucose 6-phosphate, and glucose 3-phosphate. And normally, in order to generate um, metabolic flux and to generate energy, um, phosphates are going to be transferred from high energy phosphate compounds to lower energy phosphate compounds. That way we get a release of delta G. Going the up way is going to require energy. So transferring a phosphate group from ATP up to phosphocarotene requires energy input. However, going from phosphocarotene down to ATP generates energy. Now later on, another form of generating an energy is an oxidation reduction reaction. So if you remember from Gen Chem, or if you hadn't or don't remember, this will be a slight review. Oxidation reduction reactions are just simply the transfer of electrons between molecules. So instead of transferring phosphate groups, we're transferring electrons. And these are normally coupled with um, inner, uh, the electron acceptors, um, such as FAD or NADH or NADP, NADP+. Okay, so as you can see with NAD, the electrons are transferred as a um, hydro, hydrogen that has... Um, a pair of electrons, so it's a negatively charged hydrogen. We're used to seeing hydrogen this way because it doesn't have um, an electron. It's lost its electron, but now in this instance we have a pair of electrons, so it's negatively charged. So it's going to accept that um, negatively charged hydrogen, and then it becomes NADH, as you can see here, and then it's stabilized through resonance um, in the ring and on the nitrogen and then this NADH can then later on transfer its pair of electrons to another molecule for so on and so forth. So the reducing agent is your electron donor where your oxidizing agent is your electron acceptor. So normally a good reducing agent makes a poor oxidizing agent and a poor and a good oxidizing agent makes a poor reducing agent. Sort of like when we were talking about nucleophile and electrophiles. So here our NAD plus, because it is accepting electrons, is our oxidizing agent. And our NADH, which can then donate oops, donate a pair of electrons, is our reducing agent. Okay, so electrons flow spontaneously from low to high reduction potentials. 
An example of this is in the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Electrons are passed from NADH to a series of electron receptors with increasing reduction potential, because remember this is our reducing agent, with increasing reduction potential to eventually um, O2, which is our optimum oxidizing agent or our electron receptor. The energy release during this cascade is then used to generate ATP by coupling ADP with inorganic phosphate. The oxidation by O2 of one NADH generates enough energy to generate almost three ATPs. And again, we'll talk about this more when we talk about electron transport chain in future chapters. So that's the end of this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to go over this in class. Um, our next two class meetings, uh, we are going to talk about how to determine the rate determining step in a metabolic pathway. So what enzymes um, give the slow step in the metabolic pathway? Usually these are enzymes that, have, that um, catalyze very far from equilibrium reactions, so reactions that produce a high negative delta G. And these are also going to be your sites of metabolic control. The other class meeting, oh, we're going to talk about um, understanding metabolically far from delta G reactions. So it's going to grow on what we talk about on Wednesday. So again, if you have any questions, um, shoot me an email, post it on Facebook. Um, or ask me in class, and I will see y'all Wednesday.